Hi, welcome. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for another session of Indawa's Access Live. Um, we're streaming live on YouTube and also on Facebook right now. Uh, we're live in uh, a, an actual event, physical event, um, at Arc Spaces at One Marina um, Tower. So we're really excited to be here. And tonight we have three wonderful guests joining us. Um, so very quickly, we'll say hi first, and then we'll go into a bit more detail later um, on this wonderful session about ca your cash and short-term money market strategies um, and also fixed income. Um, so maybe we can just go around and say hi. Hello, Joyce. I'm Joyce from UOB Asset Management. Hi, good evening. I'm Jessica from Lion Global Investors. And last but not least. Good evening, I'm Darren from Fullerton Fund Management. Okay, so uh, we have three amazing speakers and guests here with us today. And today um, we'll be focusing mostly on our cash smart strategy uh, that Indawas provides. And we have partnered with the three largest uh, money managers here in Singapore, um, as you've just met, um, the three speakers today. And um, I'm just going to do some housekeeping uh, stuff for now. Um, if we move to the slides and uh, show, first of all, um, the Slido. Um, so you pl please join us and please ask questions on the Slido um, website. Um, the event code is 25415. You can go in immediately. You can put questions on at any time. And you can upvote your favorite questions. So if you don't know, if you don't have any questions, you can go in and find some questions. And the ones you like can upvote. And those will be answered first. We'll also have two polls um, to gauge interest and also get some answers and audience participation. Uh, so we we'll look, look forward to that. Um, a very brief um, disclaimer. And then we'll move on to the next slides. Um, a very quick introduction. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. So I am Sam. Uh, Ree. I am the Chairman and Chief Investment Officer at Endowas and uh, the host today. I'll be moderating and I'm hoping to hear a lot and learn a lot from my esteemed guest tonight. Um, can we go to the slides uh, that we want to present today? Um, we will be having a live poll on Slido right now, so please go in and participate in the poll. Um, and uh, we'll show you the results after my presentation before we go into the main part. So next slide. Uh, oh, sorry, the slide was coming up here. What are you doing with your cash right now? So this is the poll. Please go in to Slido and answer it. Um, first one is bank savings, current accounts. Uh, next one is fixed deposits, very popular. The third one is digital platforms like Indawas. And the fourth one, no cash la. Wow, great. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with that one. So, <laughs> That's nice. um, so let's see um, who you know how this one turns out. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so quick one on Indawas YouTube channel. Uh, so we have wonderful content like today's content, but also you know we partner partner with uh, many you know uh, fund management companies, bloggers, you know. Uh, speakers like Lou, Mr. CPF, and uh, you know other fintech companies as well, and their founders. So please go to our YouTube channel, uh, subscribe below um, today, um, and we're also live on Facebook as well. Next page. And next week uh, we'll be hosting another interesting session right here again, another live event. Um, you know, celebrating our move to phase three. Um, reflecting on the best and worst money moves of 2020. So it's going to be really fun, exciting, and interesting uh, topic, uh, just like today. And uh, we have three really great speakers from the financial blogging community. So really important partners of ours, uh, great guys uh, who will be sharing their best and worst moments of 2020. Next slide, please. So very brief introduction. We've done this one, so we'll skip this one. Very brief introduction about Indawas for those, I'm sure most of you know who we are, but just a very quick introduction is uh, Indawas is a digital wealth platform to manage your total wealth. It's an open platform with a very wide choice of selection. Um, really, we're trying to solve the pain points of trying to invest your own money here in Singapore as an individual investor. Uh, the problems of high cost, 
you know, poor and misaligned advice and a lack of access to great products has been uh, a problem that we've had to face for a very long time. So Indaos is out to solve those problems and working very closely with wonderful partners like United UOB Asset Management and Line Global and Fullerton, for example. Our mission is really to help people invest better, to live easier today and better tomorrow. And as a result, we want to solve some of the biggest uh, problems in finance, such as retirement adequacy. And here in Singapore, you can't do that without CPF. So we are the first and only digital advisor for CPF money, uh, approved by CPF. Um, next page, please. And your money is, you know, I think can be you know, put into different buckets. And today, we'll be dealing with the very specific bucket, which is the green bucket here. Uh, which is your short-term money, um, less than one year is most likely, um, very short-term, like deposit-like, but also you know, uh, money market funds and also short-dated fixed income products. Um, and this should be managed intelligently as well. Just because it's short-term doesn't mean that you can't generate a, a yield or a return on it. Um, next page, please. Um, as you can see, the world is very different from where it was last year, not just because of COVID, and the social distancing that we're keeping and the mask that everybody's putting on, but also because interest rates have collapsed everywhere around the world. Uh, and Singapore is no different. Uh, just at the beginning of the year, Singapore savings bonds were above 1%. Fixed deposit rates were well above 1%. And now we can barely get even half a percent. Single, uh, bank deposit rates, as the next page shows, has fallen. Um, sorry, that, that will, I'll come back to that later. Um, <laughs> Uh, the bank deposit rates have fallen to single digits, 0.05% for current accounts and savings accounts. Um, and many of the things that we relied on, like fixed deposits, are just not enough uh, to build wealth or really generate any kind of yield. And long term, the next slide shows, uh, long term, it really, really makes a difference. This you know, effect of compounding means that if you hold too much cash, then it really drags on returns. Uh, next page. Um, so cash is a real drag. So people focus on the safety of cash. Um, so there's a zero chance of losing your principal and capital, uh, but also it gives you zero chance of growing it. Um, and also all the time you're losing purchasing power every year due to inflation. So holding the right amount of cash uh, for your everyday expenses and then really taking into your personal consideration your needs, your circumstances and your goals is really important in how you manage that cash. Next page. So Indawas launched this cash smart solution to provide our clients. It really was uh, an opportunity for us to meet the needs of our clients uh, who have been asking for this type of solution. Um, so our core solution is a very safe, steady return solution uh, with very low fluctuation, if any, in terms of uh, return and very low, if any, risk of loss and you can generate close to 1% uh, yield on that product. And on the enhanced product uh, gives you a boost by including some short fixed income by taking a little bit more risk, but generating better returns and yield. Now the beauty of these products and money market funds and these type of products is that you have all the benefits of deposits like daily liquidity, no lockups, unlimited transfers, et cetera and really, really at low cost. So these are the net yields that we envision you to generate with these products. Next slide. Unlike fixed deposits, which obviously lock you in for a long time to be able to generate even you know, half a percent of returns. So this is another chart that shows the real big difference in the kind of deposit and fixed deposit and yields that you can get. Next page. And the performance has been so far quite good. Obviously, coming out of the rebound in March, we've seen very sharp uh, recoveries. Uh, but since then, we've seen a steady compounding of yield over the long term uh, for both core and enhanced products. Next page. And if you annualize that uh, return, then enhanced generated close to 2.8% since our launch, launch in July 1st. And core has generated 1.32, so it's well above the projected yield we had at the time. We are revising down our yields, so uh, fully transparent, um, our monthly updates, if not more regular updates, giving you exactly what the markets have returned, what these products are doing, and also what the projected yields are going forward. Next page, please. 
And uh, the beauty of the product, you know, having these two products really buffer the various products that are out there. So, you know, as we explained, uh, digital platforms are now providing you with a greater choice um, of managing your short-term liquidity in cash. And as you can see in this chart, um, our partner fund management companies have products that are being utilized by everybody. Um, so Fullerton, Line Global, and GOB Asset Management, and their core products that we utilize as well, are the exact same products that are being used across the spectrum. And you can really target where you want to be in the risk spectrum and what kind of yield that you want to generate and really pick and choose. Uh, now, the beauty of the Endows platform, obviously, is that you can recreate any of this on the Fund Smart platform um, and also try new things. So the far right is a Endows Cash Management Ultra that you know, we randomly created with two products that are available that can generate you know, higher gross yield. Uh, so all of these products actually, because all the products are available on our FundSmart platform can be created or recreated um, as you wish or mix and match on the Endowers FundSmart platform right now today. Next page. Um, and the cost of doing it on the Endows platform is significantly lower than using a DIY platform, whether it's you know, a fund, su fund Supermart or a Dollardex, because we access either in institutional share classes or we have retail share classes where we receive rebates, um, retrocession fees, but we 100% rebate that back to the customer. So we do not keep, keep a single cent uh, that is paid uh, to us from the fund manager and we pass that on. As a result, we can achieve a much lower net fee. And Endowers charges a very small, flat, five basis points, 0.05% um, on that, so that we can keep the lights on in our office. <laughs> so that's it um, on our slides, I think. Um, you know, uh, the final chart, obviously, is really trying to highlight our three partners here today, Singapore's biggest fund managers, who have developed wonderful products from which we can build these solutions. And also, um, you know, Endowas is unique in the sense that, unlike other robots or many of these digital platforms, we do not commingle your assets. Um, it's securely uh, placed in a trust brokerage account in your own name at UOBKN, which is the largest domestic broker. And as a result of that, even if Endowas disappears, God forbid, um, you will be you know, safe knowing that UBKN will have custodized your assets in your own name. You have full access to it, even if endows disappear. So we've really tried very hard, especially for your hard-earned savings, especially for your cash needs, uh, to really focus on security, security, and security. So I think it's the right time to pass on the mic. And we'll have um, three, the three guests here today present very briefly. Um, on their, on, well, introduce themselves first of all, um, and then present on uh, an introduction to their company and also the products uh, that are being used on the Indawas uh, Cash Smart platform. So I'll turn over to Joyce. Thank you, Sam. Hi, I'm Joyce Tan from UOB Asset Management. UOB Asset Management is a proud member and subsidiary of UOB Bank. We have been uh, doing investment business for the last 30 over years and we are currently managing about 34 billion. And we have accumulated awards of 190 awards in the last 30 over years. Wow. So, yeah. and uh, maybe we can move to the, sorry. Uh, yeah, I have talked about this. Of course, I want to talk about our network. We are not just focused in Singapore. We have a network of five other countries, nearest neighbor, Malaysia, and could be as far as Indonesia. Uh, in China. Um, um, I joined UOB AM 13 years ago and had the privilege to anchor this uh, strategy where we call it an SGD strategy. So besides just managing portfolio around the standard parameters like diversification, interest rate, um, um, issuer concentration and things like that, but more importantly, for me, I started this a, a tighter circle whereby we focus investment into high strategic uh, teams, large market share, the defensive sectors, uh, those management that has professional team, as well as um, those, those that, that has government ownership. So this strategy has helped us through in the last um, 
crisis that we experienced. The next slide, we will show how the performance of our SGD strategy. Um, if you were around for 20, uh, if you have cash, like I hope you have uh, no cash la, like <laughs> uh, Sam talked about. If you had cash 22 years ago, you would have accumulated total gain of about 95% over wow. the last 22 years That's and we are talking yeah. about an average return annually for about 4% for a fixed income mm. instrument I think we are proud of that return and beside that there's not much of the volatility in terms of performance uh, but you can see during those times like G uh, the GFC the global crisis uh, as well as even the recent COVID situation the fund managed to bounce back very quickly and return that return for investors and give them a peace so that they can, they can sleep well at night. So that's all for me. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, important disclaimer at the end. Uh, <laughs> I actually didn't realize, but um, we have three of the most famous people in this space, in this field, but you guys have never met before, right? First time. So that was really interesting. <laughs> um, so wonderful occasion. We can spend some time afterwards as well we'll to get catch some up. Later on together. Drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Social distancing. Social though. distancing. Yes. Um, so we'll pass over to Jessica. All right. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, it was indeed my privilege to be able to speak to Joyce in person. <laughs> Finally, we, we managed to have a conversation uh, because usually we will just um, say hi. Hi and bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's my privilege today um, to introduce uh, my firm, Lion Global Investors. Um, we're, we're proud to have a strong parentage um, to be a member of the OCBC group. Um, in terms of our organization structure, um, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of the bank um, and we're directly 70% um, owned by Great Eastern. So within the group, we are the asset management arm um, and we um, have been the Asian specialist to manage um, Asian equities and Asian fixed income. Um, and we always strive to be the best in class um, for, for these fields. Um, and we have um, a long track record of managing um, Asian equities and Asian fixed income um, for 34 years. Um, and that brings us um, to a sizable AUM, assets under management. Um, of 69 billion as at the 31st, uh, 30th of September this year. Um, and behind this um, is a, a, a very dedicated team of investment professionals. We have in total 40 fund managers and analysts. Um, and on the next slide, um, it will show that uh, I'm, I'm very um, fortunate to be with um, the fixed income team within Lion Global. Um, we have 19 portfolio managers and analysts um, and among the portfolio, portfolio managers uh, we have an average experience of 28 years um, and we work very close um, in hand with um, our team of analysts who have an average experience of 7 years. Um, and on top of that, uh, we don't just work in silos, uh, we have very close um, interaction with colleagues from um, the other sections of the investment team, um, namely the equities team, um, a multi-asset strategies team, um, the curated portfolios team, as well as the ESG, the newly formed ESG team. Um, the next slide, please. So um, with uh, a very big team um, and a um, very diverse team, uh, we therefore could uh, offer a wide um, menu of uh, investment uh, products uh, within Lion Global Investors. So um, today I'm, I'm going to introduce to you um, under fixed income, um, under our short duration strategy, uh, we have a fund called Enhanced Liquidity Fund. Um, next slide please. So um, the Lion Global Sing Dollar Enhanced Liquidity Fund, um, and we like to call it ELF in short, uh, aims to do three things. Firstly, um, we want to preserve capital. Um, secondly, we want to provide an enhanced income. So earlier on, uh, Sam talked about um, the low interest rate environment that we are in. So uh, we, we want to beat that low interest rate and provide 
bring the enhanced income um, to the investor. Um, and thirdly, we want to still um, have the cake and eat it. Um, so we want to provide a very high level of liquidity. So um, to do so, um, we bring together um, a diversified portfolio of high quality securities. So we've structured the portfolio um, to have a minimum weighted average portfolio credit rating of A-. minus. So with the credits in the portfolio, they can provide coupon income um, that is above uh, the benchmark yield, um, which is the three-month MAS bill. Um, in addition, uh, we have also um, shortened the duration um, in order to preserve the principle um, for, for the fund. So um, the fund buys into very short-dated securities um, such that on an average portfolio basis, uh, we have a portfolio duration of not more than one year, 12 months. So generally, we would hold the bonds to maturity. And um, despite that, we want to provide liquidity. So um, as a, as a um, professional fund house, um, Line Global manage, uh, investors will manage um, the liquidity needs of the fund. So we, prov uh, we, we maintain a liquidity pool so that we can provide daily liquidity to the investors um, with a T plus one settlement cycle. And all in, um, we want to provide stability as well. So um, the fund is valued upon um, an amortized cost basis to provide that stability. And where we have non sing dollar exposures, uh, we will fully hatch that back into sing dollars. So that's a short uh, introduction of uh, ELF. Thank you, Jessica. That's wonderful. And last but not least, and we allow the ladies go first. Yes. Uh, but Darren, please. Thank you. All right. Good evening, to, um, everyone. I'm Darren from Fullerton Fund Management. Uh, I'll just uh, summarize in uh, three slides. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, okay, the first one is about our network, all right? Fullerton Fund Management, uh, we were founded in 2003, so that's about 17 years already. Uh, headquartered in Singapore. Um, we do have offices uh, across the region. Um, you have like uh, Shanghai, London, Tokyo and Brunei. Right? In terms of the investment capabilities, they are in two different locations, primarily in Singapore and of course also in Shanghai. We do have investment team in Shanghai out there. Uh, in terms of the uh, resources or the headcounts, uh, we do have 160 employees uh, in, in the whole firm. Uh, AUM of 44 billion or in Sing about 60 billion. All right. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is the as under management and maybe just to share a bit of thought on the left hand side. Um, you can see the bar sort of like grew um, pretty well, smoothly. Uh, the numbers sort of grew because we do have a strategic uh, so-called investment uh, with income. Uh, that sort of grew in terms of the AUM for us. In addition to that, in the last couple of uh, years, the last two to three years especially, uh, we do have uh, growth in uh, the uh, so-called uh, heritage series, which uh, you've probably heard about it, the uh, private equity business, the digital products. So as it comes along, a lot more of this continue to come into our arsenal and we continue to do whatever we can to serve the needs of the end client. And on the right hand side, um, all these assets of 60 billion Singh is being managed by uh, five investment verticals. Namely, you have the fixed income, the equities, um, the alternatives, the multi-asset, and treasury management. That's where I, I belong to. Um, the third slide, please. Uh, the third slide here is about Fullerton Sing Dollar Cash Fund. Why, why we want to put it down here is because it is a core product in the uh, cash smart strategy. So it's very important. Um, we want you to know what is it all about because as you buy into some of these uh, strategies within the Endoas uh, platform, at least you have a good sense, you have a better sense of what they really mean and what it entails inside. If I can summarize in just four key points, um, it has a low investment risk. By that we mean we diversify, we use uh, several counterparties, all right? we do have a daily liquidity, we want to ensure that there are liquidity out there to meet the needs of the end client. We want to make sure that um, the record of cash works um, for all of us when you buy into this fund uh, to provide a uh, yield that you think would be better than a fixed deposit. For example, in fixed deposit today, 12 months uh, for a um, fixed deposit, it may yield around 0 
it's a little bit low, so we are here to make a difference, to try to make it better for our end client. Uh, of course, lower fees. I think Sam, you like this. Um, you know, we all want good yield, good return, good risk control. But more importantly, we need to have a good cost structure that is low out there that it caters to the end client, it caters to the needs of end mm -hmm. and all the end uh, so-called investors. I think that's a key point from here. Right, with that, my three slides um, for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Darren. That's wonderful. And yes, cost is so critical for success, right? And thank mm. you so much for working so hard, all three of you and your firm, to you know, try to lower cost and really be pioneers in trying to move the industry towards more transparency and lower cost. And we so value that relationship that we have with all three firms. Uh, so we're going to pan out here and um, we're going to show the results of the poll, first of all. Uh, the Slido poll, um, and it's, I thought there would be a few no cash law, but <laughs> there's none. Is that right? <laughs> there's no, uh, no cash law and no fixed deposits. And uh, I think uh, it's actually because we have educated our, our audience too well. And there's been, there's no new um, people who have logged on to this. It's all existing in Dawa's customers, obviously. <laughs> so the results are that uh, digital platforms are 57% Ooh. and bank savings and current accounts, unfortunately, still 42%. Bank, oh, okay, we'll trash that later on. We'll trash that <laughs> later on. We'll, we'll get to them eventually. And zero fixed deposits and zero no cash okay. class. So okay. interesting result. Uh, we'll move to the second um, poll before we open up. So that the second poll is, do you have it up here? What is most important for you in choosing a cash management account? Um, so high returns, lower risk, speed of withdrawal because we need to get to our cash law. Um, the th th fourth one, which is capital guaranteed. Um, what is most important to you when you're seeking or choosing or selecting a cash management account? So this Slido poll will uh, last for the rest of the session while we enjoy ourselves with our conversations. Um, so we're going to move over to and change tact here a little bit. Um, we'll go to this you know, broad view um, and really make this a little bit more conversational. Um, so the first question um, I'm going to put, put to the audience and the panel um, is the title that I came up with as well. <laughs> is cash king or is cash trash? Um, so I, it alludes to the traditional you know, mantra, cash is king. So it's something that in the finance space that we grew up in, cash is king. It's always something that we talk about. Uh, Ray Dalio recently has been talking about how cash is trash. And with low interest rates, we understand where that um, attitude comes from as well. Um, so we manage cash and money uh, for our clients. And so it'd be wonderful to hear from all three of you. And for the audience, I want to maybe provide a little bit of a backdrop because um, the three guests we have, we intentionally chose the best of the best in their field, obviously. But more, most importantly, they all actually have slightly different areas of expertise. So Darren is um, head of treasury, which is liquidity and cash primarily. Uh, Jessica is enhanced liquidity, which is money market and passes into the fixed income threshold. And, and Joyce obviously is the king of fixed income, queen of fixed income, queen sorry. Income. I got the you know, gender <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, so you know, all three are the best in their field. Um, you all have responsibilities which are slightly different, so you don't overlap completely. And so the different perspectives that you bring, I think, will be really interesting uh, when it comes to cash because you have different views about it. So on this one, uh, Darren is the most, ex oh. most expert in terms of cash. So we'll save the ladies and come to them later. And Darren, why don't you start with okay. this question? Is cash king or is cash trash? Yeah. I think I should start by saying that Sam has rolled out his sleeve. He's going to trash the cash. <laughs> <laughs> Get him. Okay. Um, I, I guess if I can look at it from um, some different perspective out there, um, cash as an investment clearly is not going to give you the great return that you have for the next 10, 20 years. I think we get that part. Uh, but allow me to share from uh, perhaps um, two different perspectives, an investment cycle perspective and from a safety net perspective. Investment cycle perspective, if today we are in 2018, 
guess what? Cash is king. All asset class are in negative territory. So if today we're in 2018, you'll probably say, gosh, how I wish I got all the cash out there and no any other asset classes, right? So I think it's about investment cycle from that angle. But having said, if you look at in today's context, I know we've got to talk about today's context. Cash obviously uh, underperformed the S&P 500 by about 12, 15%, I think, in, in today's context. That shed, that shed, it's, it's good to, to let everyone understand that STI is now down about 9%. If you didn't buy the STI today, and you probably still keep on the cash, you probably did it better. Yes. Right? I think from the angle, I think it's very important. So it's an investment cycle, Todd. And if I and can it's just all relative, I guess. Exactly, it's, it's a relative, relative thing. Yeah. And the second thing is very important for us to go through is that uh, it has a safety net purpose. Today, we are in a COVID crisis. Uh, we're recovering, great news, vaccines is coming through. And the key point is that when you look at all this COVID situation, you may need medical um, fees, you may be in job in transit, job security is a concern, you definitely want to keep some cash in today's context. So, and also more importantly, your family may need cash for some of this usage, usage in current environment. So to me, cash is king in that perspective. So it's debatable, but at least from a perspective, I hope I share some thoughts around this. Spoken like a true expert of cash. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jessica. I think cash is king, or oh, cash is queen. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and you don't need to be king or queen all the time, um, but you just need to have it when you need it. Mm. Yeah. So, um, it is with, with, with everyone that has gone through COVID this year, um, I think everyone will appreciate that need to have that X months of cash mm. um, with us, um, whether it's um, uh, as a tight over during a crisis or where a job is lost, um, but just to prepare that cash um, to buy your financial asset stocks or other financial assets um, when the opportunity comes. Mm. Um, and in that aspect, um, we should not allow cash to become trash. So mm. I think Finance 101, um, the value of compounding um, still stands. Um, of course, we are in a low interest rate environment, so that value is less relevant and less significant. Um, but over time, um, we should still allow um, investors, uh, individuals to read that value of compounding. Mm. So cash has to be put to work mm. um, and cash, in order for the value of compounding to be realized, we need to put cash to work so that we can have um, cash on cash. So that's why we have an enhanced liquidity fund. Mm. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Jessica. Last but not least, Joyce. Is queen. cash king or queen? <laughs> queen. It's gender neutral. That's what we've realized. <laughs> cash is gender neutral. It's definitely but gender neutral. I was, I, was, I was discussing about this topic with a friend, and a friend said, if you're all this thing that cash is trash, he doesn't mind to be a garbage collector. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one. I suppose Darren and Jessica has illustrated why cash is not trash, definitely. Mm. Uh, I think at the end of the day is how you make use, good use of this good resource at times. Mm. Uh, it's certainly, what is cash? Cash is a, is, is a form of liquidity, it's a form of uh, value preservation, it's a form of exchange, uh, a, a medium for exchange. So cash is certainly be, be very useful if you use it flexibly, especially during time of COVID March, everybody was looking for cash. Mm. Yeah, like in 2018, mm. everybody hoped they're in cash. Yeah. Mm. So, and I wish I'm always with cash. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, certainly for this, I, I think three of us has put it very clearly out. Yeah. Cash is definitely not trash. Yeah. If you mm. have some spare, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the learnings, I suppose, is that there is a purpose to cash, for cash. Um, and we should, as individuals, ask ourselves, what is the cash for, right? Because if it's short-term liquidity, obviously we need to manage it in that way. If it's just so much cash, we all want to have more and we want to be flush with cash. But if we have too much cash, obviously, you know, there is a price that we're paying uh, by not utilizing it. And so I think 
yeah, great learnings. Thank you guys for that. And in that light, um, Darren, you wanted to add anything? No. no? Okay, I'm sorry. Good. I thought you wanted to. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, um, now with bank deposit rates where they are, right, 0.05% um, in the current account. You know, all the savings accounts that, you know, you had to use your credit card, get a mortgage, you know, do so many different things to get to even 0.5%. Now that's not even available to us anymore. We lock up our money for 12 months, two years, three years, and we still can't get to 1% in fixed deposits. Singapore savings bonds, one year, two year, five year, 10 years, is still not getting to you, getting to anything much more than 1%, right? So it's really impossible to find yield. And yet, inflation is eating away at the, at the value of cash. So um, I think we're in this conundrum. And so we're asking um, all of you who manage cash and money, um, you know, are you really seeing uh, a trend, uh, a shift in the way people manage their cash? Are you seeing demand for the type of products, whether it's cash fund, enhanced liquidity fund, or money market fund for that matter, or short-term fixed income products? Are you seeing this shift that is happening because people are seeking yield? And is that the right thing to do? Um, maybe we'll go in reverse today, this time with Joyce. Um, I think based on our, on our own experience, the, the strategy fund that we are managing, uh, it was a size of 1.1 billion at end of April. Mm -hmm. And today the size is 2.2 billion. Wow. So it's almost doubled in the last nine months. We, we have to clarify that it's not all from Indawas, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> we wish as well, but it's not. Yeah, so when I was looking at the inflow, I was pretty surprised because we took us a few years to grow our fund mm. to a one billion size. Mm. And it just took six, uh, nine months to wow. double the size, which was uh, something that I've not seen in the last mm. 13 years with UOB asset management. Can I also ask Joyce, is that coming from individuals or institutions or a good mix of both? Um, Can you when that? I check yeah. with my business uh, development colleague, apparently it comes from various sources. Mm. It comes yeah. from, of course, and dollars. Yeah. It comes from other platforms. I guess it also comes from institutions. Mm. It also came from private uh, PBs and yeah. things like yeah. that. Uh, so I everyone's looking for more yield, I guess. Mm. Everyone's yeah. looking for more yield. That and could be great one. Great products. Uh, but like what I alluded to just now, cash is a form of capital preservation. Back in April, March, we saw how mm. volatile market was. And people will be wondering, how then can I protect my asset? Mm. So one good way is go into such fund investments whereby you still can get some return over cash, yet you can escape from the storm that's out there blowing. So, and interestingly, even over time, we still see that growth until, until recently. I think it's holiday season, so the, the subscription level is kind <laughs> of tapered off. But I think it's a positive effect as, as people are, are, are thinking that how they can enhance their cash without being exposing themselves to extra volatility. And I think along the way, as we see interest rate plungers, we also attract another group of people where they saw that their, that their fixed deposit rates is not earning them much, and they, they are thinking how to make use of the cash. So our SGD strategy actually helps them to increase that little bit of uh, that, that, that return that they could, that they could get from their cash. And, and yeah. So, mm. so that's why I, I think that's why that uh, we are seeing more inflows into our fund. Mm. Jessica, you don't have to, but would you like to add anything? Um, I would say that um, over the course of the year, um, we see a good mix of redemptions and subscriptions. Mm. Um, so that there's always reason to mm. redeem from a mm. fund for certain cash needs, uh, but. On a net position, um, we are still getting net inflows. Mm. So um, even during um, the months of volatility, mm. um, March and April, um, we were seeing inflows as well. Mm. Mm. Yes. Okay. So definitely um, there is demand yep. um, for 
cash like products um, to earn a decent return. Yes. Okay. Darren. Okay. So I see a trend here. The longer duration product is seeing much more robust. You're saying a little bit of in and out, but net positive. Uh, are you going to tell us that you? Yeah, which way you want me to tilt? Which way do you want to go? <laughs> um, okay, maybe just share some thoughts from, from my perspective. Yeah. I think, first of all, if you look at the whole scheme of things, uh, fund inflows continue to pile in on a lot of asset classes. Mm -hmm. It's not just on cash funds, fixed income, everything, equity products, everything is just going up because of the fact that uh, there is a massive QE that's going through. Mm. For those who believe in investable assets, they'll buy the risky asset. For those who are not convinced, they buy cash, they buy short-term liquidity products while waiting for it to correct and you sort of buy mm. it. Um, so I think that's the, the, the macro scheme of things. Um, from the Sing Dollar Cash Fund perspective, uh, what I would say is that uh, in today's context, year to date, we're probably at one of the higher point. Uh, fortunately, and then likewise with the rest of the uh, so-called um, partners and uh, team here. Um, that, that's on the fact that uh, we're seeing a broader spectrum of um, investors. On one spectrum, you have the retail, the private bank, um, the other side of the institutions, uh, and a lot of other types of uh, so-called um, new clients that emerge. For example, digital platforms or even endowers, and a lot more of these are coming through. Um, so in short, I think uh, we are all very fortunate and blessed to have um, a very good AUM and it's continuing to grow up. Um, and I think the investors are definitely wanting to make sure that their every single dollar is working hard for them. I think that's a key point. Mm. So they're buying to all these things. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Darren. And um, uh, we have you know, questions coming into the Slido um, site, so please keep it coming. Uh, we are tracking it right now and we'll come to some of these questions and there may be some overlap so we'll look at it and um, answer those questions. Um, so maybe just one more question from me is, you know, and it's actually in some of the um, audience questions as well. Uh, we've, we went through massive volatility this year, um, unseen since probably the global financial crisis of 2008. Um, and um, major disruptions across all asset classes, but fixed income also. And so you, are, you guys are at the short end of that, and so hopefully you guys you know, did much better and looking at the numbers you did. Um, that's why you know, we work with you guys, because you are the best at what you do. But managing risk is a very stressful and difficult <laughs> thing to do, especially in those times, and I'm sure you went through a very difficult period managing that. Uh, period. So maybe you can share some, you know, personal stories, um, how you manage professionally as well, your portfolio that you um, um, were managing, and how you've seen the recovery, um, you know, and where you guys are at right now in terms of, you know, your positioning in the portfolio a little bit. Um, so we'll go back to Darren, <laughs> because you did the least. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to do so much, right? No, yeah, just kidding. Yeah. No, just kidding. Um, that's an interesting point. Um, I, I guess the, the, the March crisis or the liquidity crunch uh, caught obviously many by surprise when it sort of fell all the way down and recovered all the way up. It really caught everybody by surprise. Mm. I think as uh, managers, all of us down here, um, not that we saw this coming, uh, but I think the key thing is, if I can just reel a little bit back to before March, when I look at um, in February, for example, and I look at, say, uh, the week ending 28th of February, that's the last week of, um, of February, I said, gosh, the S&Ps are down 12%, 13%, uh, oil is down about 15 the yield of the 10-year is at down about 20 22%. Something doesn't look quite right to begin with. And also, if you look at the second half of last year, you have probably Fed doing like um, three insurance cut in the four-month space. Um, why I'm sharing all these things is because it's pointing to the fact that we as professional managers, we don't wait for things to happen. All right? We would probably resize as we go along. Second half last year, end of the year, how we position for 2020. And then we saw this February, um, you know, a bit of a situation that we feel very uncomfortable. We will resize, rejig, reposition, and go from there. So my, my point on this is that, yes, we have done something in March to reposition what we think is important, but we probably do it before that. 
And maybe just a bit of a very short um, summary of uh, what we do in this case is that uh, when the crisis came or even before that, we probably go a bit long on our weighted average maturity, i.e. duration in this case. Mm -hmm. We probably would have looked at um, the uh, outliers of the curve and that's another thing that we should look at for any disjointed situation. And perhaps also to have more conversation with the counterparties out there uh, in terms of uh, their asset liability needs, their SME needs, how the, the liquidity are going on. So I think all this conversation becomes even more intense and that will probably make us a lot better ensuring that we're securing the right strategy and also securing the best thing for our end client. I think probably, Sam, that's uh, what I'd yep. like to share. That's great. Anybody else would like to add, Jessica? Um, I would say that um, central banks today are, um, ha have learned quite a number of lessons from mm -hmm. past crises. Yeah. So um, today we see central banks being able to act much faster. Um, they, they dish out um, the stimulus um, fairly quickly. So um, very quickly, you see Fed reducing the Fed funds rate to um, 0 to 0 0.25%. Percent. Um, that was very swift and very decisive. Um, and it, it really took the market by surprise too. Um, but what also took the market by surprise was even after Fed did so, um, US Treasury sold off. So um, that was clearly a, a moment where um, cash is king, that cash is king moment. So um, over at Lion Global Investors, we, um, of, we, we were keeping a very close tabs um, on financial assets, um, where um, the, the prices of various securities are. Um, because for, for equities, um, we can monitor um, the indices, we can monitor individual stock prices. Um, but for fixed income securities, um, there's some price discovery to be done as well. So um, we, we have to um, constantly be um, in touch with the market, um, especially when for fixed income instruments, um, a lot are traded um, OTC. So um, we, we have to um, keep very close tabs and we, we constantly maintain it. Um, and the other thing is uh, we, um, we have very close interaction um, within different portfolio managers between uh, different, um, different teams uh, within Line Global um, to check on um, the situation of their funds, whether they are getting redemptions. So um, I think for Enhanced Liquidity Fund, um, uh, as I was monitoring it during March, uh, we were not um, getting redemptions. So um, initially, I actually kept a higher level of cash to prepare for redemptions. Um, but since the redemptions didn't come, um, so that was actually a very good opportunity to um, pick up investments. Um, I, I remember during past crisis, um, today we see a bond that is valued cheap. We are able to buy it cheap. Um, tomorrow, we can actually buy it cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> and we would joke that the day after we get to buy it cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in this crisis uh, in March, um, we actually see that it, that phenomenon was very short lived um, because of the um, swift uh, responses of the central banks. Yeah. So um, that, that means that um, that window uh, for us to acquire. Um, attractive assets for the fund was um, shorter as well. Yeah. So during March, for example, um, I, I remember I was buying a, a Wang Wang bond um, in March at um, 5 to 6 percent um, and I could redeem it in June. Um, so, so those were um, the opportunities that were only available during crisis. So um, as, as fund managers, uh, we, we want to always be nimble um, to have the cash uh, when we need it. Joyce, mm. would you like to add? Um, Sam, talk mm. about personal story. I'll share a personal story. <laughs> I think during March, what happens is that almost... Uh, I, for, for me, I, I, I face a different issue, unlike Jessica, who fortunately doesn't face redemption. 
uh, mm. for our fund, there was some strong re um, redemption that I have not experienced again in my last 13 years. Mm. Many things I've seen, I have not seen it this year. Uh, every other day, I go to the office and almost picking through my fingers, wow. seeing mm. how much my AUN has dropped and that means how much redemption has, has happened to the fund. Really? Wow. So it was, it was mm. a, a, a moment that, um, it, again, it's a learning moment, every moment for me. So that was how it was every day I come, I come, to, uh, I come to office, pick mm. through my fingers, okay, today is another 15 million, okay, mm. another one, eh, today we have no redemption, great, or we have, <laughs> we have, uh, we have <laughs> subscription, thank God for the support of investors. Um, but I think for me, um, Darren, Jessica speak about the actual things that happened during COVID. Mm. But I think for me, I uh, consider it fortunate that I started my career back in 1997. Mm. That's just before our Asia financial crisis. So what happened is that uh, I, I, then I was with an insurance company and we invest both in fixed income and equity. Of course, back then, fixed income is not that well developed. So, but I get to see uh, the faces of my boss when she said, Joyce, all the blue chips are penny stocks right now. <laughs> but then to me, it was because I started my career young, mm. I don't, I'm, a, I'm the kind, no cash la, you know. Mm. <laughs> so, but I wish I had cash by then. And, and that was the start of a career that I, I was thinking, if only if we have cash by then, if, if only if it happens again, I'm going to hit it. Mm. So I think most of the time when I started to manage portfolio, I have this back, it, back in my mind that I will prepare mm. for the, I will hope for the best and I'll prepare for the worst. Mm. So it's something that has, it's, it's, it's a mantra within me and within the team as I, as, as I lead the team and all the portfolios that we manage. Yes, we will adjust according to the market, but there must be a secret, sp uh, spot, a secret pocket whereby you keep your spare bullets, your dry bullets, mm. to wait for the moment. Mm. And like what Darren mentioned back in um, 2018, 2019, uh, interest rate has come, come, come down, reduced, spread has tightened, and I have even sell a credit and buy into a risk-free, almost at par kind of, kind of yield. So at that moment, it just feel that something is not right. And that's the moment that uh, we, we kept our high allocation into, in, into MAS bills. And when the, when the moment came, of, of course, that is 97, I saw the Asian financial crisis. Then of course, back in 08, the global financial crisis, um, that's where our strategy fund um, returned about 11% that year. And, and when this COVID moment came, I apologize, I was very happy. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly the moment you hit it. And I'm a big fan of uh, Warren Buffett. He says mm. that be very worried when people are buying mm. and be very scared. Uh, be very scared when people are buying mm. and be very bold when people are selling. Mm. So, but unfortunately then for us, we face a lot of um, redemption. So I could not really what, whatever special pockets has been being, like being leaked mm -hmm. because of the redemption. But more importantly, during that moment was the resistance to sell. And I like to thank the position that we have that uh, we were not forced to sell the credits that we hold. And that's very important because I think for fixed income, very importantly, once you sell, you may not be able to buy back unlike, unlike equity. Mm -hmm. So that moment, although we are facing the pressure of redemption, we kept all our bonds. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of uh, tolerated and, and endured with the uh, valuation decline. But when the recovery came, because like I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we, we do our credit research and we are so fixated and we know that what we hold are strong. So there's really no reason to sell them. And at the price that you can sell, that's the price that you want to buy. So really no reason to, to sell them. And we kept and um, of course came with the help from from the Fed, from, from the global central bankers as they cut the rates, things recover. And by then, I think 
redemption stabilized around end April, we start to see the inflow. And that's when he started to use the money. And that was buyer's market. Mm. That's the best time. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I guess we capitalized on that situation uh, mm. because our, of our position. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so we have a lot of questions in Slido. Some of them overlap, but we're going to start answering a few audience questions um, first. And um, you mentioned how when you started out, the Asian credit markets especially, but fixed income in general was not very developed, very shallow, not many opportunities. So a question has come up uh, asking about, you know, with a lot of short duration funds launched, will there be enough bonds for your fund to acquire to ensure a decent return, especially since liquidity is poor? I don't know if it's the right question. There's some other questions down below. Um, very highly sophisticated questions and very detailed, I have to admit. Um, but, you know, United SGD Fund, for example, exposure to China increased in view of recent corporate bond defaults by China. How do you mitigate this risk? In our liquidity product has 60% unrated bonds. Sing bonds, 47% are government linked. That's okay. But how about the remaining 19% unrated? These are very sophisticated <laughs> questions, I have to admit. But uh, maybe just touching on this um, issue of basically breadth of market, um, the opportunity set of investing um, and seeking higher yield, which naturally most people consider to be higher risk, and why all these questions about liquidity and defaults are coming up. So maybe more, um, I mean, maybe we can be more specific now and let Joyce and Jessica answer specifically to the short duration piece of it and maybe share you know, thoughts about you know, this breadth and liquidity and also opportunities and risks. Uh, Joyce? <laughs> <laughs> I think Joyce just spoke, so Jessica maybe sure. uh, can go first and then we'll come back to Joyce afterwards, yeah. Yeah, Thank so um, very informed investor audience. Yeah, absolutely right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <So> surprised. <laughs> yes, so indeed um, we are facing um, challenges in terms of um, finding um, the right bonds and investments to add um, to the portfolio um, and of course we always want to um, maintain um, the quality of the portfolio so um, we want to um, make sure we add um, good names um, high quality names to the portfolio and yet uh, we want to still have um, a decent return by um, acquiring um, the bonds at a certain yield um, so it's difficult, it's hard, but I would say it's not impossible. So um, we, we combed the market very hard um, and I would say that we, we actually need to be fast as well um, in case the bonds are gone. Um, the other um, um, strategy that we have would be we look in different markets. Um, we were looking in Sing dollar market, US dollar market, um, Hong Kong dollar market, um, and we're looking at um, markets of different currencies as well. Um, because our fund is in Sing dollar, it's denominated in Sing dollar, so um, we would consider um, the net yield in Sing dollar terms um, when we buy a foreign currency denominated bond and hatch back um, to the Sing dollar. So um, at times, we actually manage to get a hedging premium when we hatch back from another currency to the Sing dollar. So um, the, the short answer is um, it is very difficult to find bonds at the moment, um, but uh, we continue to uh, plough the field um, to search for investments uh, for the portfolio. Mm, great. Joyce? I guess uh, speaking from our experiment uh, managing our SGD fund, uh, we do get this kind of question quite frequently. What is mm. your capacity limit? Uh, interestingly, if I just take Jackie within that three year investment grade, if I just take 1% of it, it is equivalent to about 4 billion worth of um, value. Mm. And given the fund is only 2.2 billion, the I don't really think that, um, quite different from Jessica, uh, I, I think we do have availability of bonds. 
but I always tell my business development people it's not exactly the capacity limit but rather it is the ability for us to cherry pick our you so if I if I of course buy into everything that's available in the universe definitely the you will come off um, from the experience that we are managing the portfolio at the moment certainly agree with just Jessica that at times you've got to compete I'm sure we compete over the line <laughs> without knowing sometimes trying mm. to get you know get the bonds um, I, I think for us we, we try to make it more creative in that sense I think bonds uh, do, do come to us that we have to for us to build that relationship with our counterparties and hopefully to be the first port of call um, of course in, in, this, in this case uh, Jessica does manage a different portfolio so we may not be in direct competition <laughs> but when there's a cross <laughs> then I'm going to make sure that my counterparty call me first uh, <laughs> how do I do that I, I think that building a rapport building a relationship building of an understanding with each other uh, of what I what I'm looking for and what are the needs uh, that, that, that we can and, and the ease of transaction uh, into talking to the counterparties and of course you make life easy for the counterparties of course I still squeeze them for pricing uh, but, but at the end of the day is that rapport that we build with counterparties more than mm. just um, mechanically looking out for bonds and do the relative value has to be a bit more creative and mm -hmm. and recent deals has uh, are indeed really priced at very tight uh, pricing so what I have been doing now is that I basically wait and bonds do come and usually these are done in the secondary and these are done, these are bonds that are sold by counterparty that maybe need liquidity they need cash so that's where you can have that bargaining power to at least get the kind of higher you that you would like to and if you allow me to move on to uh, some of the questions that are being mm -hmm. addressed about china yeah. um, i'm sure those are posted by existing investors mm -hmm. who are very well versed like what jessica said about our, our fund study very deeply uh, certainly china has been a um, significant exposure but if you look at the kind of um, development within the fixed income market China has come on to be a very uh, a, a very strong issuer and based on last few years new, new issues uh, about 65% of them comes from China you can't really avoid that space mm -hmm. and sometimes when I receive this I don't receive such question. Uh, what about the China exposure? What about they are they are, they are, they are less developed? Um, I like to say this that there are perpetual China pessimists, and this pessimism may not go away that quickly. And that is good. Why? Because with that pessimism, with that doubt, with China, we are getting that extra premium for China, and it becomes cheap. And if you're able to do your deep credit analysis, if you're able to do it systematically and just fish up those that you are more comfortable with, you will basically get a free ride over that premium for really not that extra risk that you are taking. And at the beginning of the introduction, I have this circular uh, presentation about how we manage our portfolio. We focus on those names that are champion, those names that, that are strategic where, whereby maybe some uh, green environment and things like that or maybe food and infrastructure, that won't go away. Imagine mm -hmm. if China is really in a desperate situation which they are not, look at them, they are going around without masks and we still have to put on masks, right? Mm -hmm. So, and going to next year, we are very bullish and we think that China will lead us, lead Asia out of this uh, doldrum. And therefore, China is a place to be, in fact. But how do we manage the risk? We are, okay, unlike last time where we tend to run a more concentrated portfolio in China in each individual insurers, what we are doing now is further diversify, making it smaller with the accumulated 
and diversify risk, we hope to achieve similar return but without increasing risk. Mm, wonderful, thank you. Mm. If it, I may just add on yeah. China as well. Um, so just now Joyce mentioned um, this term Jackie. So Jackie stands for the JP Morgan thank Asia you for defining. <laughs> Credit Index. Um, so by definition, um, US, Europe and Japan um, DM rates are much lower. Um, and the credits, investment grade credits in these markets um, command tighter spreads as well because a lot of their um, issuers uh, are, have been around in the markets for a long time um, and investors um, in the US are very familiar with these, invest, uh, these issuers and therefore these issuers are able to um, print um, each bonds um, at very tight levels. Um, come to Asia, um, what Joy Joyce meant as Jackie, um, it actually commands um, a higher yield. Um, so that's the premium, um, the Asia premium that uh, we are referring to. So even though um, global interest rates are low, um, but within the Asia space, there are still pockets of um, higher yielding uh, investments that we can find as well. And among Jackie, um, majority, more than 50% is actually um, comprised of China. Um, and a lot of the Chinese issuers that are able to come out to the offshore space, um, and within China, they have this term called zhou chu qu. Um, and these issuers who are able to come to the US dollar market or the Sing dollar market um, to issue bonds are those which are actually of higher quality, um, higher credit quality. So um, uh, within um, international space, um, they are rated by international rating agencies. Um, and on top of that, um, in line global investors, and I'm sure it's the same case in UOB Asset Management at Fullerton as well, um, we all still um, do our own internal credit assessment um, in addition to the rating agencies um, rating, so we don't just rely on the rating agencies ratings. So um, we, because of that, uh, we are able to um, pick out um, the better quality names to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, and the other point that I would like to make um, about China is that um, they are huge. So um, some of the issuers that come um, to the uh, offshore space in the US dollar space to issue bonds, um, they, they are big in terms of scale, um, both in their market uh, as well as globally. Um, and so their funding needs are huge as well. So that means that um, they are, um, the supply of their bonds will actually um, be quite huge as well. So sometimes um, there could be um, um, headline news um, that cause a sell-off in some of these names. Um, and because their supply is huge, um, the broker community may not have the appetite to take on these bonds mm. um, and that's where the opportunity comes um, for funds like us um, to pick up um, the investments. Mm. Um, okay. yeah. So the other thing is about um, China as well. Um, I think we've witnessed um, that recovery um, that, that China has staged um, uh, over this year um, and I would say that um, in 2021 um, the recovery that um, the rest of the world um, is going to see, um, firstly, it lags behind China. Secondly, um, it's probably going to be a more bumpy than what China um, has experienced because firstly, um, I think they have um, authorities, the government who manages the situation pretty well. And secondly, um, still a net surplus, current account surplus country um, where they are still the global manufacturer of the world. Excellent. Thank you. And um, we. we I mean, time has flown so quickly, um, so we've already gone past the hour. So we're going to maybe end with a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I, I think really listening to you guys, there, there's so much opportunity in the fixed income space, whether it's at the short end or the long end. Uh, the market is becoming much more broader. Credit markets are you know, expanding. China is emerging. 
uh, Southeast Asia is emerging as well. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for growth, uh, plenty of opportunity to develop new products across the whole spectrum of risk and duration and credit. So I think um, you know when we when we have like these experts, uh, everybody wants you guys to be the predictors of the future. <laughs> And so everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the future. And so there's been a few questions about what is your outlook on rates? So everybody wants you to predict the future and say where interest rates are headed. Um, the next question also has you know, a similar question. Oh, so this is a different one. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there's a lot of questions about interest rates and where it will be headed. Um, we obviously, you know, for our products, you know, staying longer lower for longer, is that a good thing? I'm not sure. It <laughs> maybe not be so, so good, but um, maybe Darren, since mm. you've rested for quite a while now, <laughs> <laughs> you can start off for us um, um, yeah. on the outlook for interest rates. Sure, sure. Maybe start uh, globally and then you know, hone in on Singapore specific okay. as well. That would okay. be really helpful. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I guess, uh, no, I think that's a good starting point. I mean, we should look at it from a global perspective to begin with. I guess when if I can just distill in a few structured steps out there, I think the first thing to look at is, we look at the US data point in today's context, uh, it's, it's not too bad. It is quite all right, I have to say, to begin, all right? And I guess we should also say special thanks to, well, President Trump for the fact that uh, he's a believer of having tough international trade with China, with Europe, with everyone, at the same time, also American first kind of policy. With all those in mind, things wasn't that bad. And I think more importantly, why I make that point is because you continue to see some positive spin in terms of the uh, economic situation recovering. Of course, not to forget the Fed, the chairman, you know, the belief is that you want inflation to be so-called moving above 2% and for a bit more longer to come. I think that's a positive step. Once you see all this thing coming together, and what, what happened next? Steepening out of the curve is one thing that you saw in the US markets. And then of course, the next thing is nobody talks about inversion risk anymore. And all these are prelude to a recovery in the uh, US market, the global markets. Interest rate potentially will creep even before the end 2023. I think that's something that we need to think about. It's something unthinkable in today's context. Fed says, no, we're do not, doing nothing, keep it at zero, floor, ground, uh, at a ground floor level, to end 2023. My belief is that I think it can probably creep up a bit earlier than that. Mm. With that vision, Let's bring it over into nearer to us. Europe, well, we can cut a bit more, that's fine. Uh, I think they're probably stable. China, as what um, you know, the, the, the gurus have said, things are really all right, not too bad. Export data, consumer production, everything looks all right, seriously. Mm -hmm. Singapore, as much as you probably notice data point, uh, are looking a little bit on the negative side, whether it's your CPI, your Nordex, um, even your, your retail numbers, but they are stabilizing, they are recovering. I think that's what I'd like to share. And why I make the point is because with the help of also stimulus like the $100 billion that is uh, dishing out to all of us, I think it's useful. And I also feel that things like um, the cheap loan that um, the banks are getting currently, the 0.1%, so that they can pass this cheap loan to the SMEs, these are all positive spillover. All these things coming together, we probably see an uptick as what you see on the press, GDP 5% next year. Yeah, not too bad. I think that will happen. If all the things come, inflation starts to have an uptick, mm. rates start to have an uptick. So in short, I think the rates, whether it's globally or Singapore, you have a gradual uptick from here for next mm. year. I think that's my uh, overall um, perspective. Okay. Anybody want to add or disagree vehemently or have any very <laughs> strong views about interest rate outlook? No. No? Not um, really anything I, I do still think that we may still have a bit more of the lower, low for longer. Mm. Um, the, I agree with Darren um, on the steepening trend um, that the market will look through to the recovery. Mm. Um, but I would still um, believe that that recovery is still bumpy mm -hmm. um, and central banks like to err on the mm -hmm. side of caution um, mm -hmm. so they would still um, be accommodative in terms of their policies yeah, so for short-term funds like us in fact we we prefer 
a period of rising rates where um, we can redeploy um, the proceeds mm. um, of our bond maturities or inflows into um, bonds that yield more. Um, so rising rates will actually benefit the fund mm. as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I mean, interest rates is often seen as the price of money. And so, you know, currency is always tied to interest rates, mm -hmm. interest rate differentials, drive FX rates. Um, so the next question is um, going to be our final question. And this always comes up in any presentation in fixed income is cryptocurrency. <laughs> <laughs> so um, any, anybody here who purports to be a, an expert in cryptocurrency or would like to share their views on US dollar, SGD, or <laughs> FX views, any of these things? Well, since, can I talk about yeah. cryptocurrency? I'm, I'm not Crypto. an expert. Yes. Um, I guess. So let me just, does anybody own cryptocurrency here? No. no. Mm -hmm. Anybody interested in owning it? No. no. You? Do you? No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> if you okay. can just make a so short, short point on cryptocurrency, it, um, it's, it looks like it's an interesting new asset class that's emerging. Right, that's my observation. Um, I think it's getting a lot of hype, a lot of interest. You see celebrity buying. Uh, you probably see um, exchanges having the bitcoins and the likes of it. Uh, it seems to be getting better and wider acceptance. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be a positive drift of people getting more excited about it. I know currently it's 20,000. Uh, that's probably the key thing to share is as much as it's doing so well as a price action, there's probably a need for more control, uh, more regulatory on that before it goes a bit, um, you know, widened acceptance as an asset mm. class, if I may put it that way. Yeah. The interesting thing is that we call it a cryptocurrency, but currencies are a mode of exchange, mm. um, but it's actually an asset class now. So it's a store of value um, as well, currencies, but uh, yeah, cryptos are becoming an asset class and it's attracting a lot of assets. So. Uh, we're actually completely agnostic, as you know, in Dawas is agnostic to product, um, you know, so we may even carry a crypto um, fund in the future, uh, mm -hmm. so look out for that. Um, but I just wanted to end with this because this always comes up and, you know, maybe somebody had a strong view. Uh, with that, I want to give an opportunity for each of you to maybe wrap up with any last comments that you might have. Um, if you don't, then we can just wrap up. No? We good? Mm -hmm. Did you guys enjoy tonight? Oh, yeah, sure. Great. Was it fun? I hope okay. the audience uh, enjoy us too. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So I want to just wrap up and say thank you to Joyce, uh, Jessica, and Darren for joining us today. Thank you everybody for joining us uh, for this Endowers Access webinar. Um, my last to do, I've been told by my boss, Sheng Shi, uh, to uh, <laughs> highlight next week's Endowers Live uh, webinar, uh, reflecting on the best and worst money moves of 2020. We'll be holding the session again here at ArcSpace, and uh, we hope that you can join us next week. So thank you once again, everybody, as we pan out the picture so that everyone can see all of us here, safe distance. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Really, thank you. really thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night.